Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Bennett. Each episode, we talk about the research and practical aspects of the trauma informed movement. This podcast is not designed to replace mental health services. If you feel uncomfortable or triggered by our discussion, please consider seeking your own trauma treatment. In no way is seeking treatment an admission of weakness, it is a chance to build resiliency and experience post traumatic growth. You can find show notes, resources, and more at Trauma Informed. Welcome, friends, to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. I am Matt at Bennett. I am here with Pat and Tammy McLeod, uh, uh, who are the authors of a great book, Hit Hard. Um, so I'm really excited to dive into the book, dive into their story. Um, uh, a lot of our listeners know, and Pat and Tammy let you know as well, um, I, I ran a school for several years for, for what we call it, I hate the labels, but duly diagnosed developmentally disabled children. Um, basically, um, as, as will be a theme throughout, uh, a lot of our students had uh, traumatic brain injuries and uh, resulted in behaviors that made it really hard for public school systems uh, to, to meet their needs. And uh, uh, ever since working with that, uh, that, that group of not only the students, but also their parents, uh, just a special part place in my heart and reading your book uh, brought back uh, the, the struggles, but also the moments of joy in, in this journey. And so I'm, I'm really excited to have this uh, uh, conversation with you. And I know your background, your faith, uh, a lot of stuff plays a role in your story. So um, just love to give you uh, both uh, a chance to just introduce yourself um, uh, before we sort of dive in uh, a little bit around the, the trauma, but also the amazing journey that, that you've been on since. Sure. Okay, so she's tapping me, which means I think <laughs> <laughs> let us introduce ourselves and then do you want us to just launch into the story or you? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so, so yeah, I'm Pat McLeod this, and um, this is Tammy McLeod. <laughs> and um, uh, we actually serve right now as chaplains at Harvard University and we have been doing that for about 20 years now. And we're the parents of four kids. They're all pretty much adults. We still have one at home, but he's, he's a student and uh, near the end of college. What would you add? We have been in Boston for 21 years. Before that, we were in Montana living, but our full-time work is with 18 to 22 year olds. So we've done that for 36 years. Worked with awesome. college students. Including what sounds like some amazing works in, in Africa as well. I love that part of the, the story too. So, well, welcome. Uh, so, you know, it's always hard to say, well, let's talk about the reason why you're here. But I, I think you were so open in the book. Um, and I can just imagine families going through any, any sort of experience like yours, uh, a mu must read for, for your experience. But if, before we kind of dive into some of the, the questions that, that I'd love to discuss with you, if you could just give our listeners a, a little bit of background um, on, uh, on your story and, and what led you to write the book. Sure. Uh, well, our introduction into the world of, of loss and brain injury occurred the first at the first large group meeting of our year, um, we were there with our youngest son. Um, in a, you know, a couple hundred students are in this auditorium, and the meeting has just ended. Someone runs up to me, a, a Harvard student actually, and taps me on the shoulder and says, uh, "Your son is trying to reach you." So our our third oldest child was at home alone, uh, and as soon as I and he couldn't get a hold of us because our phones were hidden in our backpack and they were turned off. Uh, he had managed with some help to get a hold of someone who was at the meeting who ran up to me, handed me the phone. I answer it and he's panicked telling us that his brother had, uh, uh, well, he'd been receiving all kinds of calls first from, from coaches or from parents and then coaches and now from the hospital. Uh, telling him that that Zach had collapsed on the on the football field, that he was being airlifted to 
a hospital and he was going to have to undergo an emergency brain surgery. And um, we dropped everything. We were racing down the street of Com or Memorial Drive or where was it? What well, it doesn't matter, but we, <laughs> I guess, to get, to make our way to a hospital that we had never been to before. And when we were there, the doctor informed us that this could result in death. Uh, but it's possible that he could have a full recovery or anything in between. And I need you to sign right here. And we did. And in a moment's notice, they whisked him away. And um, you want to take it from there? So the uh, death to full recovery or anything in between, we ended up with in between. Yeah. And so we were thrust into the situation where we had Zach, but we didn't have him the same way. And for two years, we were hoping he would have a full recovery and we tried everything we could think of uh, for him to do that, but it didn't happen. Mm. And I kept reading books on grief, but they weren't helping because my family member didn't die. Mm. Yeah. And so I finally was exposed through reading uh, someone at the rehab hospital introduced me to Pauline Boss, mm -hmm. and she talks about ambiguous loss. And that's the first time I'd ever heard the term. And I ordered her books immediately, opened the book, and I could not believe it. Someone finally understood me. So I was so grateful to hear about that term. Yeah, and I, I'll just, uh, you put a quote of uh, hers in the book that, that I thought was so powerful. Uh, Closely attached people who become separated through ambiguous loss suffer a trauma even greater than death. And you, you know, one of the things that, that I, I found powerful about your story too is, uh, you know, the, the, the trauma. It, you know, it wasn't like, oh, this just ambiguous loss hit you. I mean, you, you had that, that traumatic experience and of, of not knowing uh, of that, that call, the, the race to, to the hospital. And, you know, I, I kind of, as I was reading this and, and you are so, if my audience is like, wow, Matt's really asking uh, very kind of intrusive questions. I, 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 I apologize to them, but, but you, you threw out such an honest uh, uh, narrative in the book uh, that, that I think you give us permission to, to kind of explore this is, you, you know, how, how did you see that transition from, you know, not, not knowing if uh, uh, Zach was going to survive, um, but then sort of having, I think, the am ambivalence, that the ambiguity of this is a, is a great language to use of not knowing. And I just kind of wondered what that, that journey was, was like for you, because I, I, I mad tried to put myself in your position but it is, I think if you haven't been through it, it it's just it's such a powerful thing that, that I wouldn't want to assume that I had any idea what you went through. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, that it is true, as you said, Matt, that, um, that Boss describes ambiguous loss as the most stressful kind of loss. Yeah. And, and she does that just because it's... Um, it's not a it's not a clear loss, and there's a lot of things. Tammy's much better at this than I am, but there's a lot of things that prevent a person from being able to deal with the loss the way that they might be able to deal with a more clear loss like death. So, for example, there's no formal ritual like a ceremony where you can communally grieve and acknowledge a loss. Um, in our case, we had a son who was, it was and still is uh, not only alive, but very, very, uh, to some people, uh, life-giving, you know, um, to me, for example, you know, like I just delight in, in him. There's certain things that will drive me crazy after about 48 hours with him, <laughs> like having to take him to the bathroom every 10 minutes or whatever. <laughs> but, but, um, but because of that, uh, grief gets frozen you get stuck in this unresolved grief pattern. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah. What makes it so stressful? Um, basically, there's no linear process of letting go. And rarely is there acceptance. Yeah. And then there's never closure. Yeah. 
so it doesn't end it just goes on and on and on yeah so, well and i saw it in so many of the parents of the students i worked with like and it, and it was it was as a service provider and I would imagine, I wondered if some of the, because it sounds like Zach is one of those folks that one he is from, from everything I read in the book got really connected with great services and was probably one of those people that touch our lives as being humbled uh, to, to be in, in that service provider uh, realm in my career is like, like you, you would, you would literally fall in love with, with your students and just, uh, they, they were my greatest teachers. Uh, they were my greatest inspiration. And these were kids, again, that their behaviors, you know, you didn't always love them every minute of the day, but but overall, I'd, and I'd sit in these, uh, you know, individual education planning meetings, which is the legal jargon for the educational plan in special education. And, you know, the, the parents, uh, because the, the, the child, who they are today was the only one I ever knew and the one that I really enjoyed working with, like, you know, I just, I, I, I want to wake up one day and have, you know, my, my son, my daughter be, be back to themselves and be normal again. And, and it just like, I, you know, I, I don't think if you go through that experience, it, it, you, I don't know how to relate kind of to that. And it was just, it was so powerful to hear those words, uh, especially as never knowing uh, the, 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 the student before it happened. Right. Yeah. So just a snapshot of what Zach is like now, because some people want to know. Um, he has barely any speech and barely any short-term memory. So he lives only in the present. He knows the past and he knows all his friends and he knows us, but he doesn't live there. Mm. And he never thinks about the future. So he's only one time orientation <laughs> is right here with you right now. So he's the most joyful, happy person we know, you know, so there's all those great things about it. And, but then there's this other side. Yeah. Say, Zach lived. It's so great. And I sit there thinking, yes, but I used to be changing his diapers and giving him showers and getting him dressed. And um, so all the law side, people would skip over the loss and yeah. just be happy that he lived. And so I'm just like, let me grieve. Mm -hmm. I lo also lost. I gained and I lost. Yeah. That, Matt, if I could add to that. Please um, do. I think one of the key insights that we learned in the process of going through this was that uh, when it comes to an ambiguous loss, there's there's the, the key is learning to live well with both having or not having and that by itself is incredibly difficult you'll typically do one or the other occasionally you'll do neither very well and um, um you'll and you know so for example in this case it would be living well with the son you still have that would be someone who just obsesses over over the sun that he still has, you know, and, and, uh, and lives in complete denial about the, the losses. Yeah. And uh, the other person is real, you know, is treating Zach like he's dead, uh, but, but not being able to revise her attachment to the Zach that's still there. So that's an example. And that's actually a, a, a real example because that was our story i mean yeah. that's the challenge when two people are dealing with the same loss and one is doing one and the other is doing the other it's really it torques relationships and i think that's the big thing that that pauline boss is about is she's trying to heal yeah. family systems and marriages whose lives have been torqued by anything from and it's not just this there's all there's other traumatic events that right. can bring this about but also there's you name them, you, you know all the different kinds. I think it might be helpful to actually say um, definition of ambiguous loss. Absolutely, please. Physical absence and psychological presence. And so that would be like people missing due to war, terrorism, natural disasters, um, kidnapping, incarceration, divorce, adoption, immigration. Mm -hmm. So there have to be listeners in that category. Yeah. Know? A lot of those make the, we have this adverse childhood experience study, which was one of the foundational ones that really opened our eyes to the impact of trauma. And you, you just listed off a, a whole bunch of them. And I appreciate the military deployment, having worked with the military, uh, mili schools on a military base and just what that does to families the, as well. The other type is psychological absence. 
but physical presence. So that would be Alzheimer's disease, dementia, traumatic brain injury, chronic mental illness. Mm -hmm. So gambling, um, alcohol, drugs. So it covers a lot, ambiguous loss. Yeah. Um, and then you add the pandemic to it, you know, where you got <laughs> every, everyone's experiencing. Yeah. Losses. Yes. And, and I mean, it's very similar because, you know, it's like the, in some cases, people are getting very clear losses and, and it's very tragic the way that people are losing family members and friends. Yeah. But there's also those cases where, you, you know, it's hard to feel like bad and, and to actually grieve the losses when you know that's happening and all you did is, you know, lose a graduation ceremony, you know, right. or, um, you know, a season of a sport and these kinds yeah. of things. But those are actually really significant things in the yeah. life of, of people and, and points of passage and they need to be acknowledged, they need to be grieved. Uh, and it's, it would be helpful for people to be able to do that in a community anyway. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I, you, you both do so well in in the book, and I even find myself choking up a little bit when, when I say this, is the, the loss of a, a future, an anticipated future. And I just thought, you know, I, I working with the families that I did, I, I, I sensed that, but I, I think we were so, and, and your book would have made, if I had your book like 10 years ago, I, I, I would have probably had better language to have these conversations uh, with, with the families. But it's just like that, that loss of something that was, it was kind of tangible. It was, I think, maybe taken for, maybe not granted, maybe that this was going to happen. And then the, the loss of something, which is a different loss because it was anticipation, and I, I just thought you—you you, you just described it in in such powerful language uh, that that again, I wish I would have had that uh, just when when I was working with those families. And, and I wonder, like, when you think of, about that, uh, you know, as part of this ambiguous loss, um, that that loss of future. What, what was that like to really maybe come to that realization that this is going to be different than you you. Thought, thought it was in ways you probably never even imagined uh, when you thought about your life at this point. Yeah. For me, it was hard thinking about Zach will never marry, mm. he'll never have children because he wanted to move to South Africa and work in the township that we were working in mm. with Harvard students. And he wanted to get married and adopt 10 AIDS orphans. That was his goal. <laughs> <laughs> That's some good parenting, yes. <laughs> So it was just sad thinking about those losses. Yeah. And it was actually hard watching people make milestones at first, mm -hmm. like his classmates graduated, but he couldn't go back to school and he can't go to college. So they were going off to college, but he wasn't. Um, it was also hard for his siblings too, but um, it, when I think of what is hard for me in particular, one of the things that Pauline Boss talks about is revising your attachments is one thing you need yeah. to do to be resilient in ambiguous loss. And for me, for example, we had, Zach and I had the mother-son bond, but then we had a very deep spiritual bond. Mm -hmm. So we would pray every day together before he went to bed. We would read the scripture together and talk about the future what were our dreams and hopes? And we'd sing worship songs together playing our guitar. So now his right hand doesn't work. So he plays the chords on the left hand of the guitar and I strum with the right hand. Yeah. Um, I sing, but he really can't sing that much. So it's not us singing together anymore. It's me singing and he agrees along with me. When I pray, he can't pray very much. He could he can say a sentence that you probably wouldn't understand, but I would. Yeah. He can't say more than that really. So it's me praying and he's silently agreeing along mm. or reading scripture. It's not him sharing anything with me. It's me just reading it. So we've had to revise <laughs> what yeah. we do together. But still keeping the, the, the foundation in a lot of ways, which the I think is- Yeah, is the attachment doesn't go. The attachment yeah. stays, but you have to revise it. 
And, and, you know, one of the things is, is I read your book, you know, because, you know, as, as I, as I tell any group I speak to about trauma, I don't get excited about trauma that that would say something very, very weird about me as an individual, but, but it's the post-traumatic growth that, that we can help people experience. And, you know, reading, um, you know, because, because your book was, again, very, very powerful and very honest uh, in, in the way you, you just gave the reader a, a really kind of felt like I was along on the journey uh, with you, but both the, the positives, but, but also the trauma with that as well. And I, I wonder from the uh, ambiguous loss perspective, one of the questions I kind of walked away from is, you know, usually post-traumatic, well, post-traumatic growth is in my thinking is at some point the trauma ends and maybe it's homelessness. So you've been experiencing homelessness for 10 years. So it's maybe not just something that happened on a horrible afternoon, but something that continues. And I wonder when, when we think about post-traumatic growth or gaining wisdom uh, and strength from an experience, I, I heard that language coming out and how you told the story I would just love to ask as somebody who's dealing with this loss that you're, I, I guess I, I would probably use the words and please correct me that, that is still there present with you every day to, to some extent. When I say post-traumatic growth, does that sound like something that's that's sort of real uh, to you all in your family? Yeah, I mean, I can say something about that, Matt. We, our interview is falling on a, you know, interesting moment because uh, last week, I guess it was a week before last, we received a call, you know, Zach FaceTimes me during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't see him in person. We haven't for quite a while. Um, and we get, but, you know, he FaceTimes me like every 10 minutes to try. <laughs> 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 for 10 minutes that we just had a conversation. We, we call that a good secure attachment in psychology. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so I get it. We get a call, but this time it's not Zach. It's the house manager saying that all of a sudden Zach uh, just yelled really loudly and then collapsed and started seizing up and stiffening and, and drooling. And, um, and so, I mean, that triggered reactions. I told Tammy about this and actually we haven't talked about it since, but it's, um, that triggered different emotions than even the first two times that like Zach not only had that first incident, mm -hmm. yeah. which to me actually was no big deal initially because it's, I, you know, when you have four kids and three of them are boys and they're all athletes, yeah. you're used to getting a calls that, you know, okay, Nate broke, <laughs> broke his arm again, which is like, he broke, he literally broke his arm five times. So I kind of, <laughs> was poised and I did, you know, I got used to getting these kinds of calls. And this sounded, until he said the helicopter thing, yeah. this sounded pretty minor, but even in that case, I'm like, you know, this maybe let's just not overreact until we get the deal. So I probably, you know, was, I, I just had a completely different response than I did three times later. This time my mind immediately goes to the place I may never see my son again. I may never talk to him again. That could have been the last word that I will ever hear him say. You know, all that stuff hit me really, really hard. So there's, there's that. I think there's, there's also then, though, did you want to say anything about just the trauma? I just. Oh, I just wanted to say, I'm so grateful that you do this podcast yeah. <laughs> because no one ever used the word trauma with us ever oh, in any hospital, yeah. in any counseling office, in anything. Oh, <laughs> so I was yeah. just like, oh, we needed your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, there's like 150 hours of it if you're, if you're looking for something to listen to. So uh, <laughs> I just joined this uh, trauma healing group that we're studying yeah. trauma now. We meet every yeah. Tuesday night. So we're meeting tonight. But then I just thought about what you're doing. You've just laid down so many tracks for families. So people need to hear what you're talking about 
Yeah. And, and I think to be, because it's like, you got to be in your position, especially be strong. Like that's like, I like, you know, and, and again, you shared so honestly when you weren't always able to, to stay strong, but I, you know, that, that to me is just like, and what you, you might describe, and I'm sitting here on the edge of my seat. Uh, if, if you don't mind giving me an update, if, if Zach's doing it, I, I feel like I'm kind of uh, somebody who comes <laughs> over for, for the holidays at your family. So I, after finishing your book, uh, but, but you know what you're describing in my language is post-traumatic stress. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, I'm sure you brought, we talk about this as re-experiencing not always the same emotions, but, but the intensity all starts to come rushing back uh and, and how how scary uh and, and i'm not to put words in your mouth but i can imagine that that, that was yeah. yeah it was you know and i it did uh awaken me to some of the realities of what anyone faces right now when they go to a, a an emergency room where you're not allowed in and here we have this son he his case manager is not allowed to go in we're not allowed to go in you know, if he wakes up, they don't even know that he can't be left for a second alone in a bed because he's impulsive. He doesn't know that he, you know, because he has to have a close guard, someone hands on him or he will fall when he, even though he can mobile, he can walk. Yeah. He's not. So, so all of that stuff is like brewing inside of us. It was, a, <laughs> and you know, so COVID hasn't made no. life easy for us in that regard. Anyone who has something you know an emergency situation is this face with sort of traumatizing experiences at hospitals if it wasn't already traumatizing enough just to go into an emergency room you know right but to not be able to go in is is even worse was for me but they eventually let us in that i'll end that story he okay. uh, he had he had another seizure in the emergency room while we were outside trying to still get in and finally we give up hope that we're going to uh, ever get in so we get we decide to go home and just wait it out we get a call that they're going to now let us in so I go back uh, and about one o'clock in the morning Zach uh, woke up because they had sedated him and so he was in and out for all that time and when he would look at me it was very haunting because he would look at me and he wouldn't recognize me and then he would just fall back asleep yeah but finally at about one in the morning he woke up and he looked at me and he looked again and he hasn't seen me in person for <laughs> oh yeah for yeah half months you know and he says diesel dog <laughs> which is <laughs> one of the nicknames for me which i don't know where he comes up with it but it's my name and i was so delighted oh, I'm sure. so i thanked him for faking the seizure so that we could actually <laughs> yeah. get, they, let, they, they let me stay in the emergency room for pretty much 24 hours, oh. well, not quite that much, but, you know, but quite a few hours and we did a lot of hugging and okay, I'll wind it up, Tammy. Yes. Tammy's oh, well, good. Thank you for, for the update. Uh, yeah. You, you know, and, and the, the thing is that, that when I read the book, you know, to me, it was basically a book about relationships. Um, you know, you know, and I, and I would, if it's okay, I'd like to ask you, I, I kind of put these relationships in, in a couple different boxes. Um, and I'd love to explore those with you. And the first one is uh, with when we talk about trauma, you know, and, and, and ambivalent loss, you know, the, the family relationship um, and how so much of, you know, in that, your story is so powerful because on, on one day, you're one family unit with certain dynamics. Um, and I know it not just changed immediately, but but over a very short period of time, relatively speaking, those dynamics, um, and again, ways that were incredibly honestly put forth in the book, uh, changed. And I saw this with the families that, that I worked with as well, is that they're, and sometimes their whole lives now, um, especially with uh, the, the kids that needed the 24 seven uh, monitoring, uh, everything was evolving around uh, their child. And I just, you know, one, I kind of, how's everybody doing? And, uh, you know, and uh, just from your experience of having those dynamic shifts so, so quickly. So it was incredibly hard on our kids. Yeah. The 
we had a ceremony of ambiguous loss mm. since boss recommended yeah. that and they all spoke so my daughter said to me one day you think it's bad to lose a son i lost a best friend yeah and so in a moment the person she texted about everything is no longer there um the little son our youngest who's now in college he actually slept with zach in a single bed mm. and he just loved to be with him and yeah. so zach carried soren around from the moment he was born <laughs> he was like his little child so he was like a dad slash brother yeah to soren and so in a moment he just lost that person from his life and he more went internal and became very quiet yeah so all three of our kids when they spoke at the ceremony they described what was difficult for them about the situation but it definitely torques all family relationships yeah and if i could add yeah you know this, it's not just that it torques the relationship between each of us and the person injured but it really torques every relationship yeah. in the family and on that because the family is a system and and uh so there's been, and where I would say stay, say that we're still sort of wrestling with sure, yeah. that, and and what is, you know, are we helping each other revise our attachment to Zach and to our whole family in a way that's going to be healthy? Well, and, and that's like, go ahead. yeah, like like the families that I I worked with, and what what why I wish I had your book at the time to to give to them. It, it's the in in uh, you know and your children may have voiced this better than anybody the one that do we have to go to the hospital every weekend uh you know i believe was the quote and it's like the the you know and in, in, in no way am i saying anything you've done is selfish and in fact the exact opposite but to, to have i mean you're 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 probably your life doesn't look like you thought it would at this point and and there's that that loss that's there for everyone i think we're you know again sometimes oh we got to feel fortunate or lucky and never sort of giving yourself a chance to be human in the experience and, and these parents were my heroes because of their their resiliency um uh with with their children that we often had one to one staff during the school day went home at night and these families their, their whole evening was about keeping them safe. And, and I think that the honesty that came through and, and the ceremonies, which the, the back of the book is just such, there's some real gold in there when you you talk about the, the ceremonial piece of stuff was just, uh, I, like I said, I wish I had this language uh, when I was working at the school because I think people in some ways need permission for that as well. Mm. I think you're right in saying, Matt, that this is a, like the story that we've written, first of all, I, I do hope that it will be for other people what we wish we would have had, which is yeah. a story that can name the kind of loss that we have. And just the, the, the great thing about stories is we do, we can see ourselves in, in characters and we can, um, you know, we can learn from that for yeah. one, but also stories just they like you've used the word journey a few times. I do think that a good story can take a person on an emotional journey and in the process surface and soften some of the hardest emotions that we experience in life. And, and uh, Zach's story, I think does that. I think it, it, you know, it will, will do that for people. And, but it also, <laughs> I think, begs for a bigger story that can absorb it and to make sense of it and give us hope and provide meaning. And I do think that the book has a way of pointing us toward a bigger story too that can help. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the other relationship that, that I, was, I was really fascinated with uh, turning the pages through the book too is uh, your, your faith and relationship with, with God. Um, to, to me, working mostly with survivors of childhood trauma, th this is a, a difficult thing because especially, you know, a lot, a lot of the youth I worked with that ended up in foster care or the school that I mentioned, you know, uh, just horrific uh, abuse, uh, you know, and, and the, the, the replications of that trauma. And, 
you know, wh whether I, I meet them in their teen years or working with them later on down the road as adults, you know, both the, both the kind of struggle with why did God allow this to happen to me? You know, we're, we're told there's a loving God that, you know, all powerful, all knowing. A, and obviously throughout the, the course of your book, which is kind of a, it's been an ongoing theme throughout uh, the last few months of the podcast, we get to spirituality eventually, but obviously <laughs> it seemed like a foundational piece of the way you help cope and get through it as a family, as your faith. And yet, you know, so, so I, I just, uh, you know, that relationship, I also was really, really powerful. And I wonder as being experts in, in this arena of faith and of spirituality, for, for the listeners who, who either in their own experience or maybe they're working with somebody whose faith has sort of been shaken because of things that have happened to them, no fault of their own, but inflicted on them. Uh, how, how did you manage to keep so strong in your faith uh, when I could see it going the other way, pretty, pretty, I was kind of angry at God a few times for what yeah. what happened. Uh, so, I, but you never really seemed you, you wavered maybe a little bit, but I think I wavered more than you all did. So, so, yeah. so, how did that faith serve you, and and how were you able to keep that in some of those the the dark moments that you share in the book? Yeah, that's a that is the big question, isn't it? And I think it's a question that. Uh, you know, a lot of people wrestle with, but for some reason, and this is the honest truth, I think, um, let me even back up and tell you that when I first came to Harvard, I uh, I think the year after was at a conference where I gave a talk on something Jesus says, one of the most outlandish things he says, which is, um, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I, uh, I gave a talk about that, you know, because uh, think about the, the oxymoron there, how happy or blessed are people who are sad and in mourning and grieving, you know, it just doesn't, what does that mean? And, and so I gave my little talk and this guy came up to me afterward and confronted me and said, have you ever really lost someone? Have you ever really suffered? Have you ever really mourned? And I was like, you know, he wasn't asking a question. It was he was making a statement yeah. and wasn't interested in hearing what someone who's just reflecting on this <laughs> academically has yeah. to say about it. Well, everything <laughs> he was right. You know, I didn't really have a position to to talk about that. Well, fast forward, you know, eight years later, we get this call. We're thrown into this world. It's clear to me that I didn't know how to mourn at all. Um, but what is what is also clear is that even though throughout my life, I mean, I, I, would, I studied science as an undergrad and I was, um, you know, I had a lot of reasons to doubt and to question my, you know, theistic beliefs. Um, so the question is not, do you ever doubt or have you ever struggled with your faith for me? Because the, the question, the, that answer is, oh, absolutely. I've done that a lot. But I never felt that in the midst of while on this journey. And I think, it, in fact, to the contrary, like of, of the four moments in life where I have been so overwhelmed by the sense that there is a God and that that God was there and present almost in a tangible way in my experience, three of those happened, or actually, so there have been five. Four of the five happened in the context of this journey with Zach. But, but I'm quick to add that the God that met me in those moments was not a philosopher's God. It was not like, like the unmoved mover of Aristotle, this, uh, you know, omnipotent and omniscient being. It was the suffering God, a crucified God, if you will, who, who's come into the world, who understood our suffering, who's tasted suffering in order to save us one day forever from it. And so to me, and that's the God that I felt like met me and comforted me, which is, and you, I mean, you would say something. Why, why don't you speak to it too? Yeah, just reading the Psalms, what a great resource <laughs> in the Judeo-Christian heritage. They're basically just people crying out to God. <laughs> and so I just lived in the Psalms. <laughs> and that was really restorative for me. 
to just be reminded who is God, who am I, how much he loves me. So I just kept reading the Psalms and let them wash over me. Yeah. If I can wrap that up, my I'll, I promise to be really short here. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I asked the question. <laughs> I mean, back to that story of that guy who confronted me after the talk. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is that those moments I tasted a what I could only describe as a blessedness, a joy of being near to a God who understood me and loved me. And that's actually what I said in that talk, you know, but it was some, so I don't think you have to go through suffering to learn certain lessons, but it's because of that, even in those moments, the moment that I was crying out in desperation and all of a sudden overwhelmed by the sense of a God who loves me and who cares for me and who's come into the world to rescue me, that brought me more deep, it brought me deeper into the story of redemption. And this is, and Pauline Boss actually mentions several times in her research that actually religion, right, can be of help for people yeah. in, in uh, working through trauma and getting resilience in the midst of loss because it, because it attaches them to narratives of redemption. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and gives us hope. So yeah, and, and it's it's sort of a joke. It's, it's not a joke because it's true. But you know, it gets a good laugh during my trainings is like, whenever I'm fortunate enough to talk to folks who have been through that traumatic journey, and a, a lot of the folks I work homelessness addiction, um, you know, some of the, some of the worst human conditions you can experience, uh, veterans of war, obviously, in, in that as well. And it's like, what is the moment where it started to turn around? Uh, I always, I, I thought Joseph Campbell's hero's journey was actually talking about the journey of trauma in so, so, so many ways, you know, and, and the, the thing that I, they always get, it's like, well, I reconnected with God and got a good case manager. Like that there was, the, there's this mix of faith. And I think folks in uh, the, the professionalized helping healer, uh, we don't we don't talk about the role of faith and spirituality enough, um, and I know that it's tricky. It's it's ground we've got to thoughtfully approach and manage uh, from from the, um, our our roles. But again, to me, it's it's right up there. One, you connect with another person uh, who sees something in you might you might not see in yourself, and then there's that reconnection to spirit. Uh, that that is part of that kind of kickstart on to that other part of the journey. And I, like I said, I'm a big advocate. We need to talk about this and, and learn from each other uh, too. Because again, your story is, like I said, that relationship with God, uh, you know, is such a powerful theme uh, throughout. Um, and your honesty is, you know, I, I imagine, and as you're talking, it's different today in some ways than it was before all this, this happened as well. Yeah. So my, my final relationship, and even though we've talked about some tough issues, this might be the contentious one, <laughs> is the relationship with football. Um, ah. I know, I know, I know. And let me just, I will stake my claim on whose side I'm on. I don't know where this is evolved. But, uh, you know, I actually gave up football about three or four years ago. Uh, I, I found myself as someone who talked about trauma's impact on the brain. I shared some of my work experiences. I just realized where my entertainment investment time and energy was going and decided to take it somewhere else. But I, I found, you know, as sort of a fan of your work, uh, and it's, I know I can't detach this from any of the energy and intensity throughout the book, I, I found as a reader, the, the relationship, um, and again, I, like I said, the back of your book is don't stop when the story ends. There's gold in the back of the book as well. At least I got the PDF version, uh, but, but there's the pictures and everything were just amazing. Um, but where's the relationship right now with this, this sport, if I can ask, cause I was, I was flipping through to see sort of, uh, yeah. where, where it ended up. And so, uh, yeah, I, I just wonder, and I'm from Denver, obviously. So the Tim Tebow, <laughs> I lived through Tebow mania too, oh. which is a huge part of your story. So 
Yeah. You kind of got the good, you got the, the, the horrible traumatic. Uh, I thought when you snuck uh, him out to the football game was maybe like uh, when I'm thinking about the movie of this, like <laughs> the, the best scene of the whole movie will be that scene. Uh, you just kind of want to throw that question if it's okay to, <laughs> how do you look at this thing uh, that's so important to our culture yet is so devastating <laughs> so many times too? So do you want to start? <laughs> we, well, we agree on one thing that, Kids shouldn't play tackle football before 14. Yeah. Um, and then from there we've mm. <laughs> so I don't I don't watch the game anymore because I just now that I know what happens to people's brains, I can't do it. Yeah. Um, I still for the Super Bowl, I just went to a Super Bowl party downstairs in the house that we live in and I just hung out with people and talked to them. Yeah. So I didn't watch the game, I just hung out. Yeah. Um, so that's what I tend to do once a year is just go someplace and spend time with people. But my big thing is not just the trauma that it causes to men and boys brains and then their lives as a result, just a lot of people becoming depressed, suicidal, killing themselves, doing dangerous things and ending up dying, et cetera, et cetera. But it's too it's when I walked into the movie concussion, the big thing that hit me was not the damage to the players' brains. It was the damage to the families and friends. So the wives who had to deal with this and the yeah. kids who had to deal with issues because of their dad's brain not working anymore and friends left behind and mothers weeping. And yeah. so it was just, the effect on the families and friends. Yeah. I think it's not worth it, but Pat yeah. disagrees. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, two gets one here, Pat. Let's yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I, let me begin. Yeah, by, yeah, give a little history because you're, you're not coming <laughs> from that's, the, that's, yeah. An unbiased perspective. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, like you said, I forgot you're, you're uh, a Colorado guy. So yeah. you grew up just, uh, across the border of Wyoming in Cheyenne. And so we were huge uh, Bronco fans. We were season ticket holders since I was really young. My dad was a college football player who got drafted. He didn't play because he was too banged up. My brother did play professionally for five years and was very good. And we both played college football. And Zach was a very good football player. And, and his youngest brother, well, Nate was a great football player too, but his youngest brother was probably better than all of us. Um, but, um, and he, we pulled him out. Um, so I just, I mean, there's just, there are some things that I think are really virtuous that get produced in the life of a young man by playing that game. Um, now you could argue there are other sports um, and there are definitely uh, other sports where you can learn a lot of those things. Um, you know, just the, the, the determination, the dedication, the discipline, the, the team dynamic. Um, but I personally, and this is also sort of a theological concern of mine is that I, I've sort of declared war on the radical individualism that that has come to characterize the American democracy. And I, I, not that there's nothing good about the commitment to the individual, but when it's uh, at the expense of everything else and there's no sort of sense of communal identity, that that's really not a good thing for a society. And there is no sport, I don't believe, quite like football when it comes to its ability to pull together such a broad range of athleticisms and even physical and mental characteristics together. And then you add to that the, you know, the, the team and the staff and the, all of the, all that goes with it, the fan base, the cheerleaders, the, um, the way that communities form beyond the, the community of the team of brothers, you know, that, but you put all the, I mean, I had a guy that was twice as heavy as me when I was in high school, he was over 300 pounds and I was like 145 <laughs> and he would block for me, you know, that do, and he would move half of the field off <laughs> for me to run. And it's like, but, but that guy couldn't even run all the way around the football field without stopping about 10 times, you know, 
and I could fly, <laughs> but I could, you know, not move mass the way that yeah. his mass could move mass. So you get that kind of combination of body types and personality. It, it does bring people across races together, and which is a significant fact, um, you know, it, where, where this is practiced. So I, I think for those reasons, you know, I would love for them to find a way to make it safe on brains. I'm not sure that it can be done, though. So yeah. I... <laughs> and, and the evidence is becoming, it's mounting, that, that it's not just, what happened to Zach was a fluke, but yeah. what's not a fluke is the long-term effects of these recurring like headbutts, yeah. it sounds like, and, and, and uh, the number of concussions. So anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's, and you know, I was born uh, Catholic in South Bend, Indiana, and if you're a football player, I don't need to explain uh, that, that, that if I don't root for the Irish, there's a special place in hell for me. So, uh, you know, th this was not taken lightly, uh, this yeah. decision, because, you know, you, you're right, you, you lose your tribe in, in some ways, and yet, yeah, it was one of the, it, was, it wasn't an easy thing, and my wife has to put up with my existential crises, uh, but, but it's, you know, it's really an interesting, I think, time that, that we're in around uh, this issue. And, and obviously you, your family story, and I, I love, I, I won't give it away, but Tim Tebow makes a, a huge guest appearance uh, in this book. And I think just a way that, you know, Tim Tebow kind of became this cult of personality in a lot of ways, but really shows at the core you know, who, who he was, if we could just kind of remove all the cult of personality pieces away. Um, mm -hmm. the, the story is just like, just so, so touching um, uh, that, that is told in your, your interactions with, you know, Tim and his family. And, you know, you know, does that happen if, if not for something like football? And it's, it's this really tough time because, you know, from my, that, that brain is just developing so rapidly. Like if we could hold off starting till 25 or 26 <laughs> then the science would say you probably shouldn't do this but <laughs> you've come along enough and that that's where i just think it's a it's a struggle of you know how do like you said how do we find a safe way to to do this and i'm a i'm a, also a kid who grew up heading a soccer ball uh yeah. probably a, a few thousand times that i wish i could have back uh, too. So yeah, it's, but I, I think again, in the book, it was just such a, uh, an interesting uh, experience that you had with that, especially again, from your background of, mm -hmm. you know, having professional, uh, you know, football players in your family is, is really powerful. Yeah. Is there, is there any other, and I appreciate your honesty, uh, both in the book, like I, like I said, I feel like, uh, you know, you know, you wrote a good book when I feel like I'm, I'm like the uncle from out of town who comes over for Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, so I feel like I, can, I, I need to catch up with how everybody's doing, but um, just anything else in the few minutes we have left, any other big kind of takeaway lessons that, that I may have not have uh, touched on uh, that, that for folks who might be experience uh, a, a loss uh, similar to, to yours in some way, um, any suggestions or, or other lessons that, that you'd like to share? One thing for me that we didn't get to under relationships was marriage. So I, I would just say that yes. for a partner, grieving can actually isolate you would think that when you hit a really hard thing in life, it would pull you together, but because people grieve in different ways and on different timetables, it just can really crunch the marriage. And so just the respect to hear each other's view, how are you doing? Just letting the person talk, not trying to fix them or read their auto, your autobiography into their life or solve yeah. their problems. Just let them talk, let them mourn, grieve, um, and stay just it's possible to stay together <laughs> yeah which is statistically you're you're in the minority of and i again i, I would also suggest folks going through this uh you know i like you said i think there's the percent oh this will make us stronger this will you know tra trauma doesn't necessarily do that we 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 can go into our own corners we all grieve dif differently which is not necessarily our personality when we're not grieving and I, that was a really powerful thing i appreciate you uh bringing that up um as well is 
really powerful part of the story is how you took time uh, and again, kind of gave us uh, behind the scenes uh, look into the, that it wasn't all easy uh, and that, that how you overcame some of those, those struggles. Uh, so that, that was a huge piece of the book as well. Yeah, if I could give my two cents on that, I think if I could recommend two things that, um, on the marriage front, one would be, um, and this is all, you know, just stuff we've learned from our own counseling journey. Uh, number one is just to be gentle with each other when you're in the midst of these ambiguous losses. And, uh, you know, that's, that sounds so simple and, but it's so important. And, you know, um, we found that to be, I mean, that has echoed in my mind from our counselor and it still does even like a couple of weeks ago when Zach went back in the hospital, I'm like, um, just be, I need to be gentle with Tammy because this is hitting her as hard as it's hitting me, you know, and I, I that gentle means, you know, pay, being patient and, and, and not always saying the things that are going through your mind, you know, and, uh, and we would, that would be my second thing is that we sought out grief therapy and, uh, or I guess that's what you call family therapy. And we just made a, a rule that, first of all, we wouldn't talk about anything that's really stressful after nine o'clock and then if we started finding ourselves about ready to get into an argument we would be let's just wait until we're with our counselor and we'll we'll do this in his presence because we fight so much better when someone is there watching i don't <laughs> you know we don't manipulate each other we don't say things that you know you can say yeah. when it's just you and it's one-on-one -on -one. but it's like if you know if you say that this he'll call you out on that <laughs> because it's not true or it's hurtful yeah. or it's whatever and so uh, yeah, I think that that's really helpful when people are going through traumatic um, grief, and um, that's it. I, think. Uh, I just have to say one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was tempted to think because tragedy happened to our life, in our lives, or if you would say trauma, yeah. like trauma happened in our life, then our life's going to be ruined. Mm. I actually totally don't believe that anymore right. awesome. that our story can be just as good moving forward. And so that was really, really an important thing for me to understand. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I congratulate you because I, I know, and I congratulate you not just because you woke up one day and you were there, but the book plays out the hard work and the thinking that you've done around this is, for, for so many parents, and I would really try to support them, though, sometimes it was almost too ingrained. It all become, their life becomes really only dedicated to the trauma and the, the you know, when we talk about the loss. And some of that is just the, the intensity of the situation makes it almost impossible not to without a great deal of effort and support. And, you know, again, your story serves as a great example is, you know, and you may have not have framed this in my kind of therapy voice, but like, who, who are we, you know, and this is a part of our story. It's a huge part of our story. It's going to be a part of our story moving forward in the future, but who are we beyond the loss? Um, and that's where I took great inspiration from, you know, you're almost, you're, you're, you're the role models for why therapy could be such a, a good tool and not that you couldn't have got through it without it, but it just sounds like it was such a important tool to, to do that work and find that, you know, I, I guess I would look at it as a little that that space for for you and and you know I would imagine in the book I'm also seeing what's our relationship to our other children as well with with the loss but also outside the loss as well and and how you put that forth throughout the book was just incredibly inspirational uh, uh, with that as well. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. It's really been great to be with you. Thanks for hosting this and letting us be yeah. a part of it. Oh, thank you. So 
hit hard. Um, obviously, get, is it? Did just tell everybody about the book where where they can get it. Usually, it starts with an A and is a river. But uh, <laughs> just, just just a little bit. Um, we'll put also some information at traumainformlens.org in the show notes so everybody has links. But uh, I, I hope uh, the audience gets. Uh, if you're a professional, you need to pick up the book. If you're experiencing this, uh, you know the the loss yourself. Uh, it, it's it's a really important read. Uh, how how can people uh, you know find the book? And I, I know this is not more than just a writing project as well. So I'll, I'll give the last minute or so. Uh, give some folks who might be driving in their car right now uh, maybe uh, some information on how to learn more about uh, you and your work. So our website is Pat and Tammy McLeod M C L E O D dot com. And on there, you'll find a lot more about ambiguous loss. And we wrote COVID conversations that covers dealing with it during the pandemic. Um, on there, also, you'll be able to see four different places you can buy it, but it is on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we, if you end up reading this book, do let us know, because we go through and we read every single review. Like it means a lot to us to know how it affected people's lives. So we would just love to hear um, how it may have helped you. Thank you. Well, again, thank you both for putting this into the world. Um, uh, like I said, I can't wait for Thanksgiving after COVID. I'll, I'll be there. Uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll go for a walk while the boys watch football or whatever. And uh, <laughs> just, just, just judge them and all that stuff. But I want to <laughs> seriously uh, thank you for the great book. Um, again, it put new language in my vocabulary in a way that made it very real. So uh, thank you for the great resource you, you gave folks struggling with the loss, but, but also the world as well to bring this to even more people's attention. And uh, um, I, I'm glad uh, I got to share it with my audience as well. Great thank to be you, with Matt. you, thanks. Yeah.